through verse number 20. 11 through verse number 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, one of my favorite chapters in 2 Corinthians. It's so convicting at times, but so good to read through. Verse number 11 of chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I need to finish with verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Praise the Lord for the reading of God's Word. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the message. Dearly Father, we thank You so much for Your gift to us. The gift of eternal life. Life that will never end. Life that is just beginning. Father, we ask You to bless this message may you help us to see your word afresh and anew again father help us to know you better help us to know what we are in christ and father may you help me as i speak help our hearts to be tender soft towards you and help much be done for your kingdom's sake i pray all this in jesus name amen This is the last time we'll be talking about missions for the foreseen future. Now, it could come up in different sermons that I might preach, who knows. Uh, But this will be the last time as the calendar says, okay, we need to finish up missions today. And I don't think any better description of what we have in Christ is better than what we just read. We are new creations if we are in Jesus Christ. Uh, That means I am not the old me. Amen. You wouldn't like the old me. (laughs) I don't like the old me. Uh, (laughs) um, But in all reality, we see what we have in Christ. And the word that I love the most in that phrase is that we are now then ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is an interesting title, right? If you call yourself an ambassador, that means you're not from here. That means you're a stranger here. That means if I became ambassador to Egypt, I don't know why Egypt, I just want to go there. Okay, see the pyramids or whatever. I go to Egypt, I am the ambassador to Egypt. I don't think our current president would want me to go to Egypt, but that is besides the the point. Um, But yeah, you think about it. I'm going to back myself out of that one. Um, Think about it. An ambassador 
is called by someone in order to go somewhere that they are not originally from in order to do a work that that person wants him to do. And one person that was a pastor, he was on a flight. He uh, was sitting next to a person and uh, like usual, he, he thinks of different ways to, to try to win somebody to Christ and to show them who Christ is and, and all that. And so he, he got an idea. And the guy sits next to him, and uh, the guy looks over. Oh, so wh- what do you do for a living? And he says, I'm an ambassador. Really? You're an ambassador? Yep. Yep, I serve a king. Really? Do you know him personally? Yep, I sure do. I know this king personally. And he said uh, many different things. Oh, where are you going? Well, wherever he sends me. And uh, so he, he goes on and on and on. Wow, you must have a, a great retirement plan. He says, yeah, it's out of this world. <laughs> but on and on and on. And then he gets to the fact that he is a pastor and he proclaimed Christ and, and showed him who the King of King and Lord Lords is. And so he, that person got saved. Amazing. Uh, story that that's a true story by the way according to to what the guy wrote in his book um interesting though we're all 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 of us are ambassadors that means we're not from here that means this world is not my home i'm just a passing through uh that means that i have a commission from a king you think about it if and you can pick the president, uh, if you don't like our current one, if a president calls you up and says, hey, I, I want you to do something for me. Most of us, if it's a person that we actually really do like, we will say, yes, sir. What is it, Mr. President? Oh, I need you to get some, uh, I don't know, some coffee from the drugstore and just bring it to the White House. I don't know if he would ever send that to you, but still, that would be an enormous honor, right? And I remember, uh, I think, believe it was J. Hudson Taylor that said, if it, it was, if it is an honor for an earthly king to give you something to do, how much greater an honor if it's the king of kings? And so, just, a, just an amazing thing that we are ambassadors for Christ. But in order to understand the fact that we are ambassadors, we have to understand more and more the commission that we are giving. And so we've been going through the different words that Christ gave us in the Gospels, and now we're going to conclude today our Missions Emphasis Sundays with that of the Great Commission itself. It's seen in three different places, and just so that we're not turning back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, I have it on the screen. So we're, we're going to go through four elements of the Great Commission, and hopefully that we will have more of a burden for the lost. We'll have more desire to see people saved, we will have more of a heart to give towards missions than we once did. So first we have a commissioner. If you have a commission, there is a commissioner, one that gives a commission. And you notice with me in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, what does it say? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, and Jesus, okay, Uh, notice with me mark chapter 16 verse 14 afterward he that's jesus appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen not only is it jesus but guess what it's a risen jesus Uh, Think about this with me. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, He came into the world and He was despised. He was rejected of man. He was a man of sorrows, touched with our grief. And so here's what happened, that Jesus Christ was the greatest missionary who ever walked on the planet. He had a commission. His mission was to save, to, to seek and to save those who are lost. And He came into this world And his world rejected him. But then, knowing his purpose, in that garden, sweat, tears of blood, not my will, thine be done. I don't know what that means. (laughs) You say you're you're a theologian. Well, not a good one. No, (laughs) I try to be the best I can. Uh, You think about it. Not my will, but thine be done. 
how in the world does God the Father have a different will than God the Son? I don't know. But it's true. <laughs> God says to God, not my will, but thine be done. Shows the submission of Christ to his heavenly Father, no matter what it is in front of him. And he sees what's going to happen to him. He knows that he's going to die. He knows by what death he's going to die. And he goes forward with that mission. He died a death that none of us want to relive. You know, the greatest way for me personally, I've been thinking about this, how would I like to die? Boy, that's kind of morbid, isn't it? Um, How would I like to die? I thought to myself, hmm, in my sleep, I go to sleep one day, seeing this place, the next morning, I wake up in glory. This is great! I didn't have to do any suffering. I didn't have to do, have any pain. Oh man, that would be excellent. That's probably the way I want to go. Uh, the worst possible way is you know, jumping out of a plane without a parachute into an ocean filled with shark-infested water. I don't know. It's kind of that mentality of you know, what ways to go. But here, Jesus Christ dies a death that is worse than anything we can ever think of or come up with. He died for our sins. But I love it. Three days later, three days later, up from the grave, he arose. Praise the Lord, he arose with a mighty triumph over the foes. Amazing. He is not only Jesus, he is the risen Lord. He is the risen Savior. He now has conquered that of death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? It's in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross, but he couldn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day, proclaiming himself the victor over every single foe there ever was. Praise the Lord. And it's this Jesus that we're looking at right now. Acts chapter 1, verse number 6 and through 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, goes on to commission there. Here's what it is. He's the Lord. He's the king. He's not only just Jesus. He's not only just the risen Lord. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. The one that we should say yes, sir, no matter what it might cost us. So many missionaries go into the field and they miss the conveniences of this life. And so many times they get frustrated and they stop and come back. But missionaries that last a long time, they say, I don't care. Let this world go. I'm going towards a kingdom that will never end. I don't care what kind of discomfort I might have. And we we witness many different missionaries with major discomforts. Missionaries that we have seen in the past three weeks, they lost children. They lost wives. Adoniram Judson was married three times in very short periods of time in between. Uh, Just amazing. All that he lost, but still, he went forward for the gospel. He is the king. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king that will eventually restore all things to the way that it is supposed to be. This world is just temporary, but what he's going to put down is eternal. And we're going to be serving with him in this kingdom. It's going to be a a great thing. So we first see the the commissioner. Now we see the authority. Notice with me what he says in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The, The ability to do things for Jesus has to come by authority 
you just can't go and, and do many different things for, for a king's name or a president's name and not have the authority to do so. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us the authority because He has all power is given to Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 16, it gives specifics about what this power entails for the first century church. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now I say that that's only for the first century church because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that which is perfect is come. What, what is that? The Word of God. The, the reason why that they had to have signs in order to authenticate their message is because there wasn't something that they can see that vindicated their message. Okay, they needed signs. They're not going to listen to you unless there is some sort of sign from God. What was the number, the first sign that was given during the day of Pentecost? They started speaking in tongues. Now, I don't believe we can speak in tongues today unless it's learned. Uh, you know, I, I know a little bit of Spanish. See? No. Donde está el bono? You know, that is what you kind of need for to, to speak in, in Spanish, but that's a learned thing. But for speaking in tongues, it's automatic. The Spirit gives you utterance, and then you speak in a known tongue. Amazing. But yet that ceased in the first century because that which is perfect is come being the word of God. We have so much power in the word of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So we see in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, gives the, the authority giver, verse number 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You have power, you have the authority because the Lord Jesus Christ gives you the authority because of who He gives us. When I got saved, I did not know automatically I became the house of the Holy Spirit. I did not understand that. But it is true nonetheless. The Bible declares that we are indwelt with that of the Holy Spirit of promise, that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise the moment that we get saved. We are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, you might say, well, that, does that mean that, uh, that I have the fullness of the Spirit every moment of every day? Well, that's an interesting thing. It's, the Bible commands us to be filled with the Spirit. So there are times that we might not be so close. We have the Spirit with us. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us but yet how much He controls our, our doings, our walks, our talks, our thoughts. That is a choice that we have to make. Be filled with the Spirit. But then, we have the authority. We have the commissioner. We have the authority. Number three, we have the command. And there are three specific commands that are given. Uh, really two commands, but I lumped one and another because it's so good. And Matthew chapter 28 says, Go ye therefore... And teach all nations. The word teach there means that of disciple making. All right, so teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Amazing. And then we see in Mark chapter 16 a different slant on the, the command Go ye into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Somebody is saying, oh, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, this verse contradicts that. He that, is, that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Yeah? I'm saved because I believed. I'm baptized, so that shows salvation to everybody else. But he that believeth not... And is not baptized. No, no, that's not in there. But he that believeth not shall be damned. God has judgment against people that reject Christ. 
And that's a fact. The command for us is to go and present the gospel to people that have not heard so they can come to saving knowledge in Christ. That is the command. But it goes beyond that to say, okay, I have presented the gospel to an individual and that individual said yes. Now it's my responsibility to take them aside and teach them, disciple them, make them into more like Christ. How do you do that? Well, you do that by coming to church. You, can't, you do that by listening. You do that by participating. You do that by going out and uh, at we, when we have evangelistic events, which eventually we will get back to doing that to come. So many things that we can talk about with that of discipleship. Do we disciple in our prayer meetings? We need a disciple in many different areas. So this is the command. But then we see in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Question. Has the entire earth heard? In our day, no. No, it hasn't. There's areas in the world that has never heard once the name of Jesus. There's not, there are many places in the world in the 1040 window <laughs> that if you're caught proclaiming Christ, you will be imprisoned, tortured, and or put to death. What an interesting time we live in. But yet, still the command is for us to go. And so much that we can talk about missions. So we see a commissioner, we see the authority, we see the command, we, now we see the commissioned. Who is Jesus talking to here? In Matthew chapter 28, verse number 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Who's the them? According to the text, the 11 disciples. All right, moving on. Matthew chapter 16. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed them, not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, who's the them? The 11, okay. Acts chapter 1, verse number 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, one of my favorite names in the Bible, Theophilus, lover of God, amen. And of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. The question that we have, who are the commissioned? Well, according to to this, these texts, it's only the 11. We're off the hook. All right. Wait, wait, wait. No. <laughs> no, that's not correct. The 11 are the basis of the church. They're the foundation of the church on the apostles and prophets. So for us, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ today, that means you and I have this commission to do. So how are we in doing that? The question is, have you and I submitted ourselves to whatever God wants us to do for missions? Whether that be to support more, which if our faith promise is going to grow, we need to, by faith, give more. Okay, But more than that, are we doing what we need to do in order to reach our neighbors for Christ? Are we doing what we need to do in order to reach our co-workers for Christ? Are we doing all we can do to touch people at the store for Christ? Or people just we happen to meet there sitting at the you know, mechanic or something. It's not just a happenstance. It's a God-appointed time for us to tell. So many things that we can do 
whether it be giving out tracts, whether it be just by us giving our own testimony to people that wonder what's the difference in us. And we could tell them all about Christ. So many great things we can do for, for missions. I hope and pray that the entirety of this time together, we have more of a burden for the lost. We have more of a burden to support missionaries, the more of a burden to know God better through helping us to reach others for Christ. I just hope and pray that this is an encouragement for each and every one of you. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time that we can spend here now in your word. How great you are that you have given us the responsibility to tell others about Christ. How so often we don't. Help us to be submissive. Father, may you bless this time where we talk about faith promise missions. About our giving. May it make this time profitable. May you make it sweet. Father, may you bless my speaking about it. And may, may it make sense about what we're about to do. I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.